This is NASA TV. Good morning. I'm NASA's Gary Jordan. Thank you for joining us remotely for the first in our series of briefings to preview the upcoming Crew-1 mission, the first crew rotation mission on a U.S. commercial spacecraft to the International Space Station for NASA and for SpaceX. This briefing will kick off today's agenda with updates from leadership representing both NASA and SpaceX. Joining our esteemed panel, coming from NASA's headquarters in Washington, we have NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein and Kathy Leaders, Associate Administrator for NASA's Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. Representing SpaceX from Hawthorne, California, we welcome Hans Koenigsman, Vice President of Build and Reli Flight Reliability. We'll first start with some opening comments from each of our briefers before opening it up for questions. We'll be taking questions on our phone bridge as well as on our social media platforms. If you're on the phone, please press star 1 to add your name to our queue and ask a question. If you're on social media, use the hashtag AskNASA. We'll begin with initial remarks from Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Gary, um, I think everybody knows uh, we are now in this new era of human spaceflight where NASA is a customer, not the owner and operator of the hardware, and so that's very exciting. What's exciting about this upcoming mission is that we are actually going to fly a certified Crew Dragon, and, and, and the idea that we're going from a test vehicle, which was what we flew on DM2, to now a certified crew vehicle for regular rotation of, of flights um, this, is a, this is another milestone, a critical milestone in the development of our ability to launch American astronauts on American rockets from American soil now sustainably. So these are, these are very exciting times. A couple of things that make this mission even more exciting. Uh, number one, we're going to have uh, an international partner with us on this very first crew mission, Soichi Sun from Japan. Uh, he's, of course, a veteran astronaut. He's done amazing work on, on the International Space Station already, um, and now he's going to go back uh, with us again this time on an American rocket. Um, the other big thing is we're actually increasing the capacity to do research on the International Space Station. So when we increase the number of astronauts on board, we're going to be able to get three times as much science done and three times as much technology development complete. And all of that is critically important for for our Artemis program and eventually our Mars program. So as we develop Moon to Mars, we're going to be using low Earth orbit to test all of these capabilities and technologies, ultimately to create a sustainable return to the Moon and then take all of that knowledge um, onto Mars. So, so this particular mission is another critical milestone. We're very excited about it. Um, and, and of course, we've got a great panel today to discuss these and, and other things. So. So thank you, Gary, and I'll look forward to answering questions a little later on. Thank you, Administrator. We'll now hand it over to Kathy Leaders. Thank you so much. I always hate to follow Jim because he does such a great job. So um, I wanted to kind of emphasize that, as Jim had mentioned, this is a great milestone for us. Um, it's a culmination of many, many years of work with NASA and SpaceX. and. Um, there's a lot of folks out there that have contributed to us getting where we are today, and I really would like to thank the team that has gotten us here. Um, a tremendous amount of work, um, and, and obviously for my past job, this means a lot, um, but I'm really looking forward to in my new role continued in to see the success of this commercial crew program. Um, as I, I was able to, for the first time, I think, actually provide breaking news last night that we're moving towards the, the launch being on uh, October 31st, a uh, nice Halloween launch. Um, and uh, uh, moving towards this, uh, we've been, the team's been carefully laying out planning, working through the sequence of, of the timing of a Soyuz arrival. It's a very busy October for us, Soyuz arrival, getting everything ready, and then, and then obviously getting ready for Crew-1. Um, we're very excited to be heading into our operational missions. This has been, this is a culmination of, of uh, a dream of us to have commercial crew rotation seats up on station and looking forward to many more to come. Thank you, Kathy. Now we'll hand it over to Hans Koenigsman from SpaceX. 
Yeah, good morning. Um, I'm honored to be here with the, uh, my NASA colleagues, and uh, I would like to thank them for working with us and entrusting us um, flying NASA astronaut um, to, to the International Space Station on the uh, Crew Dragon first operational mission. The, uh, as has been mentioned, the, uh, the, uh, we are targeting right now the October 31st. At, uh, it's very early in the morning. It's 2.40. It's actually still the October 30 in, uh, in, uh, in California. Um, for this particular launch, um, we're happy to support NASA in any schedule that they need, and we will use the additional time to review um, uh, things, build records, whatever we have, um, over and over again until we're really sure that we are safe, safe to fly. In, in general, um, you know, we, we, will, we will fly when we are ready to fly. That's been our, our promise um, all the time, and uh, that's what we did in the, in the last mission. Um, for the past year, and, and working closely with NASA, we have been super busy and uh, had a couple couple of missions that got us to this point in time here. Uh, we launched two CRS missions, among them the last um, the last Dragon One resupply mission, and uh, and uh, Dragon, you know, just to, just to remind everybody, has been in service by now for 10 years, uh, which seems seems incredible. And it's been such a such a remarkable and successful program. It. Uh, helped us develop, uh, you know, our, our capability on both building spacecraft, operating spacecraft, um, and last not least, working with NASA and working with the, the International Space Station. It's all been super exciting and, uh, and, and, and very important. Um, we really like to thank NASA for all their support throughout the company's history and uh, getting us to this point. Then we also did a in-flight escape demonstration in uh, January. And then, of course, if you if you recall, in May uh, this year, we launched the uh, Demo 2 mission, and uh, and returned human spaceflight to the United States for the first time since nine years. It was an amazing mission, and uh, it was an incredible honor to fly Doug, uh, Bob, and Doug. And I do have a quick uh, Demo 2 video recap for you. Good morning, welcome aboard. Dragon, SpaceX, Comtrack, ground stations. SpaceX, Dragon, we're go for launch. Let's light this candle. Three, two, one. Ignition. Lift off of the Falcon 9 and Crew Dragon. On behalf of the entire launch team, thanks for flying with Falcon 9 today. We hope you enjoyed the ride and wish you a great mission. We would like to uh, welcome you aboard Capsule Endeavor. We do have a, a friend on board with us, Trimmer, the Apatosaurus. I think I was requested to do a backflip. Good night, Megan and P.O. And Karen and Jack. MD Houston flight. Houston is go for undocking and departure. Dragon is committed to undock. SpaceX Dragon on Dragon to ground. We are ready for the systems brief. Copy. As stated, Dragon's in a healthy state. We are proceeding toward the primary landing site, and uh, your timeline is current. Two drugs out. 300 meters. We have brace for splashdown. Copy brace for splashdown. Endeavor, on behalf of the SpaceX and NASA teams, welcome back to planet Earth and thanks for flying SpaceX. It's a, it's a humbling experience to be a part of uh, what was accomplished. It's great to see how excited everybody was 
we hope it brings a little bit of brightness to a pretty tough 2020. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. Uh, it's always uh, it's always amazing to see the the videos of uh, successful flights and uh, missions and launches, and uh, it gives me a little bit of uh, goose goosebumps. Um, anyways, the demo two was extremely extremely clean for an inaugural mission. Um, Bob and Doug gave us great feedback, and uh, basically on everything from the ground uh, ground supply all the way to to uh, the spacecraft itself, and uh, and. Uh, it, it was a long way to get to the point, but uh, I, I really feel like we did it safely and, and reliably and uh, built a, sp a great spacecraft, um, and they, they tested it very well during the first mission. So th there, there are still, there's always lessons learned, and uh, in this particular case, we uh, learned a couple lessons. Um, one of them is related to the heat shield. Um, we found on, on a tile a little bit more erosion than we wanted to see, and um, it had to do... Um, it had to do with obstructions within the heat shield itself, um, where, the, where the spacecraft is, is mounted to the trunk, basically. And um, in that in that particular area, we redesigned the uh, the heat shield tile, and um, and and uh, and uh, at this point in time, everything has been tested and is ready to go for the next mission. The other lesson learned was uh, related to how we measure the altitude during the uh, parachute deploy. Um, Last time we deployed, we deployed inside the allowable box, absolutely no problem, but just a little bit lower than we expected. And so we improved the barometric um, altitude measurement and um, we improved the cost check with all the other navigation sensors for the next mission. And then uh, last not least, uh, we, we closely coordinate uh, between NASA and SpaceX with the US Coast Guard um, to establish a 10 mile keep out zone for, for any boaters um, to make sure that the recovery is safe and that our crew is safe, the astronauts are safe, and uh, and the public um, the public itself is safe. And so we're going to have more boats um, on the next go around and uh, and make sure that the area is really uh, clear of any other other boats. Um, we already implemented that. Um, we uh, we are at this point in time reviewing documentation, uh, making sure everything is good to go. We do have a uh, static fire ahead of us and uh, several um, simulations also to keep the, the crew and uh, and ourselves, uh, you know, sharp and uh, good to go. And uh, so um, I'm definitely looking forward uh, to moving into the operational phase with Dragon and uh, having more and more operational flights over the uh, next coming years. Um, talking about uh, the uh, next coming years, I also want to talk about quickly uh, about the Cargo Dragon 2. We had a uh, picture a while back. I'm not sure if we can show this again. Um, well, it's a... Uh, there it is, exactly. That's the, uh, that's the new Cargo Dragon, right? This is a CRS-21, or in, in, in NASA language, SpaceX-21, I guess. Um, and it's, it's, it's very similar to the old Dragon in the way that we load the cargo inside, basically, and there's a trunk that has external cargos. Um, very similar. The difference is that we use the, um, the arm on the, uh, on the tower now to just walk in and, uh, and load it there. It's going to be a little bit easier for the, for the crew to do this. Um, and, uh, but, yeah, it's, uh, it's essentially, uh, you know, proven, proven technology on our side with a, um, you know, an updated and new vehicle um, that's very, very similar to the, uh, to the crew, uh, uh, crew version. Um, once this Dragon attaches to the station, it docks actually like the uh, Crew Dragon does. Um, it will be the first time that we have two Dragons on, on, the, uh, on the International Space Station. That's, uh, that's pretty amazing. And if you think about it, we, going forward, we actually anticipate right now that during 2021, we will always have at least one Dragon attached to the space station, um, either, you know, bringing, bringing uh, astronauts to the space station or bringing uh, the resupply cargo um, depending on which, which vehicle it is. Again, we're honored to work with NASA, um, its international partners, and, the, uh, you know, and support the important research and experiments on board of the space station. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. We're humbled to be the nation's premier provider to the International Space Station. Thank you. Uh, thanks to all of our briefers for those initial remarks. 
We'll now open it up for questions. Again, if you're on our phone bridge, please press star 1 to submit a question. Once your name is called, please state to whom you'd like to direct your question. We'll have a lot of questions, so if you find that yours has already been answered, press star 2 to withdraw it. On social media, please use the hashtag AskNASA. Let's start on our phone bridge with Joey Roulette from Reuters. For doing this. Um, question is for Hans Koenigsman and, and Jim Bridenstine or Kathy Voters. Um, I was just wondering generally what uh, work is needed before we can officially certify Crew Dragon um, and if there's any specific uh, details about that that you could provide that you learned from the DM2 mission, that would be um, great. Thanks. Jim Bridenstine, why don't uh, we start with you? Yeah. So, so uh, I'll, look, I'll defer this to uh, to Kathy. I know it's uh, it was her program until I pulled her up to headquarters to run the entire human exploration program. So, Kathy, I'll I'll defer to you. Yeah, I think the the major work is in a couple of different areas. One is is in updating the design, and the two areas that Hans already mentioned, which is. Um, some very localized upgrades of the um, TPS and those attach points. And I know in the press conference following this, Steve Stitch, even though I hate the fact that he gets to do this, <laughs> I'm sure he'll talk about it a whole bunch. So, but, you know, obviously we had to update that certification. You know, we did a demo flight to learn. And so we found out that in those particular locations, we'd like to have an updated design. And so, the, the new work is, in, is focused in that area. And then we did make a design change to, to um, change a, a screen design and then also change, like Han said, how we were measuring the barometric pressure to um, determine what's the right altitude to be able to deploy the drogue chutes. And so really the big chunk of the certification is in up the, those upgrades and then any deltas, you know, Demo 2 provided a capability to be able to dock on the forward element, um, on the forward docking um, area and uh, Crew 1, because it's a full uh, increment crew, is giving us a new capability to also be able to dock on the Zenith port. And so those were um, capabilities that were needed for our increment missions, but weren't needed to safely fly crew for our Demo-2 mission. So the team's kind of doing their Delta certification efforts. The, the big chunk of the work had been done prior to Demo-2. Thank you for that answer. We'll now pass it over to Salen Babauer from Gannett Industries. Thank you. My question is for NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Sir, how historic is this first operational mission of Crew-1 in the history of human spaceflight? Thank you. <laughs> oh, you bet. Well, look, here's the thing. Um, in November, we're celebrating 20 years of having people living and working on the International Space Station. And it just so happens that when we launch on October 31st, early in the morning on Halloween, it will be 20 years since the launch of Expeditionary Mission 1, EM-1. So this is a, this is a very exciting time for the agency in general, um, but it just demonstrates the value of the International Space Station um, without this, this, uh, this tool that we have, not just a tool of diplomacy, but also science and technology development. Um, we've been able to, to go from you know, flying space shuttles and now flying commercial vehicles um, demonstrating that we can drive down costs and increase access. So I think probably from a historical perspective, the most important thing is we have fundamentally changed the business model for how NASA does business. Um, we want to be a customer, especially when it comes to low Earth orbit. We want to be one customer of many, and we want to have numerous providers that are competing on cost and innovation. We have proven that out with commercial crew, and now we're getting into these regular, regularly scheduled missions for Dragon. Um, and of course, Starliner is, is coming up soon. In fact, the crew that's about to launch on October 31st, they're gonna be there when the very first star, Starliner attaches to the International Space Station. So we're gonna have two independent uh, companies that are, you know, have very uh, unique solution sets to achieve 
space flight and docking at the International Space Station. Um, and I think that's, that's really, a, there's a lot, of, a lot of historic firsts that are about to take place, especially with this crew. So it's, a, it's an exciting time. Next we have Lauren Grush from The Verge. Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. Um, I recall with DM2 there are constraints on the Crew Dragon's lifetime in orbit because of its solar panels. I'm wondering if those uh, similar constraints are on this mission or if the Crew Dragon's lifetime in orbit has been extended. Thank you. So the, these, the, the solar panels are different for a longer duration. I'll, I'll leave it to Kathy. Oh, sorry about that. Um, stepping on you there. Uh, it's a fully certified vehicle, so 210 days. Um, and uh, so, as Jim said, you know, there's an upgraded solar uh, panel design, and so every aspect of the vehicle is 210 days. Thank you. Uh, friendly reminder for our callers to please state to whom you'd like to direct your question. Next, we have Michael Sheets from CNBC. Hi, all. Uh, I just wanted to uh, ask a quick question that could be answered by either Kathy or Hans. I, I know that Crew Dragon is designed to hold up to seven passengers. I would, I'm wondering at this point uh, when you might expect to see that full capability utilized. Uh, I know this is a big step from two to four, but I'm wondering uh, whether or not you have any missions planned in the near future that would expand that all the way up to the full uh, seven passengers. Thanks. So from a NASA perspective, I'll answer first and then let Hans talk about the capacity for seven. Um, you know, our capability is for four, but we also have this unique, um, we have unique requirements for us to also fly powered cargo payloads that take up extra room and then additional cargo, right, where um, other missions in low Earth orbit may or may not have that, those types of requirements also. So um, the NASA capability is, is for that, the full complement of four crew members like Jim talked about. Um, and, but that, that's what trades off our crew and cargo requirements for these missions. Yeah, we always have the option, um, but as for NASA missions, we, uh, we use the space right now for cargo and, uh, and extra capability, and uh, we, we will continue to fly four astronauts to the International Space Station. Um, as, and, and also on the, first, on the first mission, we will learn on how, how well the uh, EGLIS, the uh, life support system, uh, continues to work with four people. And, um, and then going forward, um, we will look at, at other options. Next, we have Andrea Leinfelder from the Houston Chronicle. Hi, thanks for taking my call this morning. Um, so I recall of demo two, oh, and this question's for Kathy. Um, I, I recall of demo two that we launched in the afternoon, partly because of the astronaut sleep schedule. We know we need everyone to be able to get a good night's rest and to sleep at the right time. So I was curious as to why we decided to launch this one at 2.40 in the morning. Thank you. Well, I, I, wish, I wish for um, my boss's sake I could launch this, this mission in the afternoon, I think. Because um, really what drives when we launch is the phasing. So when, when the rocket and the International Space Station kind of line up together in the best way for us to get there. So really physics kind of drives the time frame for when we launch during particular, um, on particular days. So it worked out really nicely for us on our launch in May that we were able to provide a nice launch window in the afternoon. Um, I was hoping I'd be able to do the same thing for this mission, but um, we're gonna have a great launch, <clears throat> excuse me, early in the morning instead. So um, night launches are very beautiful. <laughs> Next, we have Paul Brinkman from UPI. Uh, yeah, hello, thanks for doing this. Um, I guess my question is for Hans, um, or actually about the four-person four capacity. Um, I'm just wondering if you could kind of go through how egress of the capsule will work. And um, I'm also wondering if anybody there knows 
whether this is the first time in history that a capsule will carry four people. Hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking really fast here. I'm trying to remember if there's any other capsule with four people. I mean, it, it go, going in, into the capsule and getting out of doesn't change with four people. It just takes uh, probably twice as long as with two, one after the other. And um, we have a crew that supports, um, you know, the astronauts and how they settle in their, in their seats and make sure they're all you know, buckled up and uh, comfortable. And, uh, and so I don't, I don't see any, um, any changes here. And also, if you, if you keep, keep in mind, uh, Dragon is relatively, you know, roomy for a space capsule um, for, for uh, two people and also for four people. Um, you can still walk around there a little bit. So I don't, I, I don't anticipate any, any uh, you know, space constraints um, with four people at this point in time. And regarding your question um, for four, four people in a capsule, I, I, I think you're right, but I'm absolutely I'm not sure. I would say from the American perspective, you had, you know, Gemini, Mercury, Apollo, none of them had four. You had the space shuttle, which was not a capsule. Um, and now we're back to the capsule model. Uh, I, I would have to say, from an American perspective, um, I'm pretty, pretty sure that this is the first time we've launched four in a capsule. Um, and I, I think that's probably true for our, our, our international partners as well and, and others around the world. One of the things we did on demo two to make sure that this design was certified was we actually did an on-orbit checkout where we, even though Bob and Doug flew up, we actually went and put four crew in the capsule on orbit and did all the operations and made sure that we could meet all of our requirements, which also include like being able to get out in 90 seconds and a bunch of other requirements too to make sure that we can live and work and safely operate the capsule with four crew members. Next, we have Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Uh, for Kathy Leaders or Jim Bridenstine, I know the plan going into commercial crew was to have mixed crews on U.S. and Russian spacecraft, uh, like a Russian cosmonaut on all U.S. crew missions and a NASA crew member on all Soyuz missions through a, a barter agreement. Uh, that doesn't seem to be happening, at least with these first few uh, operational uh, Crew Dragon missions. Uh, the one Crew 1 and Crew 2 uh, doesn't have a Rus Russian cosmonaut. Um, so just wondering if you can update me on uh, securing an agreement for, for mixed crews on future crew launches, both U.S. and Russian, uh, you know, beyond the seat uh, you have secured for the Soyuz uh, next month. Thanks. So we, we still believe it's critically important um, that when we have an international space station where, you know, half of it is American and the other half is, is Russian, um, that we have crews where we have, you know, uh, Russian cosmonauts launch with American astronauts on the American vehicle, and American astronauts launch with Russian cosmonauts on the, on the, the Russian Soyuz. We think that's critically important. I know our partners over at Russia also believe that that is important, and I know that we're working towards that um, between our, our two agencies day in and day out. Um, but I, I, think, I think there's broad agreement that um, if, if, if both countries want to maintain uh, a permanent presence on the International Space Station. That is, that is the end state we need to achieve. Um, so, so we're working towards it, and I think we will get there. Uh, Kathy, if you have any more details, feel free. Uh, yeah, you're exactly right. We're in the process of uh, coordinating, implementing agreement to work towards that. It's um, right now. It's about which mission do we implement that and. Um, but as far as I'm concerned, the sooner the better, right? But Jim's exactly right. It's very important to us. Um, we feel like it's critical for our maintenance on orbit, and um, we're both working towards that. Next, we have Chris Davenport from The Washington Post. Hey, guys. Thanks for doing this. Uh, I guess my question is for uh, Hans. Just a technical question to follow up on the heat shield. Uh, I wonder if you could say, how much erosion uh, there was. I mean, it sounds like you still had plenty of margin. Uh, was it across the entire heat shield or just in a localized area? 
And when you said, I think you said you updated the screen design, I wonder if you might explain uh, what that means. Thanks. Certainly. Um, so f first of all, this was a, a, a small area in the um, in the heat shield, and in particular the area around what we call the tension ties, which hold um, the trunk and the uh, Dragon spacecraft together. Um, in this particular area, we saw some flow phenomenon that uh, I guess we didn't really expect, and we saw erosion to be deeper than than we anticipated. However, I mean, this this heat shield is massive, and over the entire acreage, there was was very little erosion. In this particular area, it was a little bit deeper, and um, and uh, but nothing nothing to be concerned at, at all times. The astronauts were safe, and uh, and the vehicle was working um, perfectly. So this is something that we just in the inspection found and uh, looked at it and, and decided, oh, okay, we should probably uh, you know. And, and reinforce the heat shield in this particular area, and it's, it's actually four areas just around the tension ties, uh, a very, uh, very small area compared to the oval acreage of uh, the heat shield. And then um, I think Kathy's comment uh, regarding screen um, refers to a, um, a sort of a filter that um, filters the air going into the barometric pressure sensor. Um, that particular filter has been uh, opened up a little bit so that it's uh, less constrained, and that has the effect that we measure the barometric pressure more accurately when we come down and deploy the parachute um, right on time. Um, that, that is something that, you know, was also not, not a particular problem the last time, but, you know, going forward, it is, uh, it is a safety improvement and will make sure that um, we will launch astronauts um, and, and land them, of course, uh, safely, you know, in the, in the upcoming years. We'll now take a few questions from social media using the hashtag AskNASA. This first one comes from Israel on Twitter, who directed his question to Kathy. What value can the taxpayer expect out of NASA's partnership with SpaceX? Well, I think, you know, like Jim said, you know, our goal is to one day be able to buy services in low Earth orbit, right? So this is one step on our process for us to get there. Um, you know, we're, we're taking this in careful steps, but, but for us to be able to continue to do what we feel is our charter, which is to go and do deep space exploration, um, us moving towards a commercial, a commercial platform in low Earth orbit and being able to use commercial services is, is a goal of ours. And so us taking this first step with a commercial service for our crew and cargo capabilities now is an important step in that process. This next Ask NASA question comes from Jim on Twitter. This one's for the administrator with Crew-1 and a Russian launch to the International Space Station. Uh, the station will have a larger population than it has in quite a while. Any impacts from that that are anticipated? Yeah, some significant impacts. Um, once, once we have, you know, a bigger complement of astronauts on the International Space Station, we can do a lot more science. Um, and that's going to that's gonna give us a return um, even faster, uh, make no mistake, we've had huge returns from the International Space Station already, but now we can get even more, even faster. Um, you know, the, the previous question was about what are the returns we're going to see for the American taxpayer from the, the commercial crew program or the SpaceX Crew Dragon. <clears throat> Bottom line is, um, you know, we are, we are making every effort to industrialize space as fast as possible. So we look at advanced materials and we look at industrialized biomedicine. Um, the compounding of pharmaceuticals or the creating of, of immunizations, the value here is microgravity. We can't create microgravity here on Earth. Uh, you can. You can do, you know, drop towers. You can send airplanes on, you know, parabolic trajectories in order to get microgravity. Um, but ultimately, it's a very short duration. When we get to orbit, we can have microgravity for months, um, even, even up to, you know, a year. Um, well, we can have it for 20 years, as is evidence with the International Space Station, but any individual astronaut up, you know, up to a year. Um, and so what this means is we get to maximize the utility of microgravity for research. And ultimately, we're focusing our research for a day when that research becomes applied. Um, so when we think about the ability to 
uh, create human tissue for people um, that, that maybe need new tissue, whether it's you know, skin or, or, or something else. Using your own adult stem cells, we can create your own tissue in the microgravity of space. When you do it in the gravity well of Earth, it just goes flat. Um, so there's a lot of benefits. You know, I like to talk about advanced materials, creating an artificial retina for the human eyeball so people who have macular degeneration don't have to lose their eyesight. And there's so, so, so many more things um, that, that we get from, from these kind of activities. And of course, um, when we think about Kibo and our partners on the International Space Station from Japan and some of the capabilities that they've put um, that give us the ability to put instruments on the outside of the space station, both for, for astrophysics and the study of the Earth, uh, to increase crop yields while reducing water usage, to transform how we do agriculture. Um, there, there are so many benefits to commercialization. The International Space Station is really the place to prove all of these things out. And then it's up to the private sector to make determinations that it's worth capitalizing um, and, then, and then using these commercial capabilities that we've built. But make no mistake, NASA has a long history of commercial capabilities. We think about you know, people watching this right now on the internet, for example, internet broadband from space, Dish Network, DirecTV, uh, you know, GPS, how, how do we navigate? How do we produce food and energy and do disaster release, relief, uh, predict weather, understand climate? Um, the, the returns here are really astonishing. The International Space Station is, is an amazing capability for the country. Um, and, and of course, um, having more crew on the International Space Station makes all of these advancements happen faster. And that gets us to a day of commercialization faster than we could have done otherwise. So, um, so this is really, it's a, it's, it's a great time uh, to be at NASA and it's a great time to, to, to see all of the amazing developments happen. We'll now return to our phone bridge over to Jeff Faust from Space News. Yeah, good morning. Uh, I wanted to return to the uh, issue of uh, certification and uh, when, this is for Kathy, when you expect um, to have everything wrapped up and have that certification review and how soon can that certification review take place before the launch? Uh, thanks. So we've actually had our program level certification review already and we had our status at the agency level. So right now we're, we're just in the process of finalizing um, the last few pieces of, of uh, documentation that we need to close out our human rating certification plan, which I view that will be done probably in the next week to 10 days. And then our final, final cert we will be doing at our, uh, as part of our flight readiness review for um, crew one. So we're kind of doing it in, in two phases, finishing up our human rating certification plan, which I think should be in the next week to 10 days, and then uh, finalizing, kind of dotting the I's, crossing the T's at our flight readiness review. Um, that will be coming up about a week before we, we go into crew one. Next we have Eric Berger from Ars Technica. Yeah, hi. Thanks very much for doing this. Uh, my question is about commercial space. I think all of you are true believers. Um, Hans and Kathy, obviously, you guys have been doing this for a long time. Jim, I think everyone on the phone could chant along with NASA wants to be one of many, many customers. But I'd like to know whether, Jim, you know, in the four months since Demo 2, you've seen a shift from the non-believers in commercial space, so the skeptics uh, who maybe thought commercial space wasn't up to the task. have. Have you seen any signs that sort of, you know, maybe more people are realizing the, the potential here? Uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I can tell you that the enthusiasm for what happened on Demo 2 was extremely robust. Um, among um, people within the U.S. government, of course, um, among members of Congress that fund NASA's budgets, but people, um, but that enthusiasm was not just in the government. It was also uh, nationwide. I mean, the entire world watched and and was in awe of of the accomplishment. So, so I do believe that there is a, there is a very rub, robust. There's a lot of support um, for um, for these capabilities. Um, and so, yeah, I I, th I think it's I think it's as strong now as it's ever been. I think um, some of the doubters um, have have um, you know maybe been been made to to not doubt so much because it has now happened. Um, 
But I, I also think, look, commercial crew was, was, was really the second part. We were resupplying the International Space Station commercially with Northrop Grumman uh, and SpaceX ahead of that. So the, the next big thing, Eric, and I know you know this, the next big thing is commercial habitation uh, apart from the International Space Station, which is something that we need, we need members of Congress to be willing to fund. We've put it in the budget request every year and it never gets funded at the level that is necessary to achieve the end states. Here's what we know, Eric, there's gonna come a day in the future when the International Space Station is going to have to end. We don't like to think about it because we really, really love the International Space Station. But we also do have to think about the fact that 20 years is a long time and it can't last forever. We have to be making the investments right now today so that we don't have a gap in low Earth orbit. That's what's been lacking. We haven't had the investment necessary to guarantee that we don't have a gap in low Earth orbit. And it's critically important that we make those investments. Um, and I think, I think right now, more than ever, we do have those believers that you're talking about. They are willing to step up to the, fl uh, up to the plate and fund the budget request at the level necessary to eventually you know, get commercial habitation so that there will be no gap. And that's, uh, that's one of the things that <laughs> we're working on every day to make sure that, that there is no gap. Next is Marsha Dunn from the Associated Press. Yes, hi. Th this question is for Hans, please. Um, I think when people hear certified and operational for this upcoming flight, um, many, at least in the public, are going to think that all of a sudden dragon flight for humans is routine, if you will, and, and that kind of phrasing got NASA in trouble in the shuttle program. How, how do you, how do you, you know, do you look at this as uh, routine now that you've got one under your belt? And, and also, do you feel a lot of the pressure is off now that you had a successful test flight on this vehicle? Thanks. Well, um, that, that's, a, that's a great question, actually. And, and honestly, um, I, I don't feel that this is over at all. I feel like we need to actually step it up. Um, the transition from a test vehicle to an operational vehicle to a production vehicle is, is very difficult. Um, getting this, um, you know, in, in, uh, in an operational phase that is safe and, and has all the scrutiny and the rigor of human spaceflight um, is, is, a, is a lot of work and, and very, very difficult in itself. So I feel like um, we, we actually, and, and we responded that way within, within SpaceX. We, we stepped it up. We, um, we do more reviews than ever. We, uh, we pay incredibly scrutiny to the flight data of uh, Demo 2. And um, there's a huge effort going going on to make sure that both Falcon 9 and then then also um, Dragon is, is safe for all the future missions and, and can actually stand up for this huge task of uh, of supplying the station both with cargo and also you know bringing astronauts up and down. It's a it's it's a it's a great responsibility and um, and we, we like I said earlier we're honored by this, but it's also you know. Uh, <laughs> at, at least, at least I personally feel that it, it, it weighs on me, and, and we have to work harder to make this work safely. Yeah, Hans and I talk about this a lot, and it's about staying vigilant. You know, stay vigilant, and uh, that as a team, we need to stay vigilant. We need to keep going. We need to operate in a safe manner. It's a, it's, it's a very important for us to not kind of take our foot off the gas, right? We've got to, we got to keep operating in a safe and um, in a safe manner. Next we have Douglas Messier from Parabolic Arc. Um, yeah, I had a question for Hans. And um, did this problem come up on the first demo mission? Uh, with the heat shield, and exactly what did happen? Did you have uh, problems on all four connections where the the capsule is connected with the uh, with the trunk? Yeah, the, the best way I can explain it without you know slides and and lots of data is that these um, these tension ties that connect the the, uh, the trunk and the spacecraft they cause some uh, disturbance in the airflow around them, and then there's a little bit it. it 
it digs a deeper hole into the heat shield right after that because there's probably a vortex or something like that. I don't know the, uh, the exact technical details on this one, but um, the, the effect is basically that one, one particular tile has basically more erosion than the others. It uh, tunnels basically into the tile. Um, and, and like I said earlier, this was always a safe situation. It never got to, uh, got to structure. Um, the, the overall heat shield was working great. Um, so it's, it's something that, that will, is, is relatively easy to fix by um, putting a more resistant or erosion resistant material in that particular place. Uh, because you want to be careful. You, you don't want to make too many changes at this point in time either. Um, and then, and then basically uh, tested. We did that last week, and it uh, it came out great. And uh, so I'm I'm confident that uh, we fixed this particular problem um, very well. Next, we'll go over to Irene Klotz from Aviation Week. Hi. Um, actually, had a similar question from Doug, so I think I'll just continue his for a minute. Is uh, for Hans, um, what what estimate? percent did the PPS ablate relative to your predictions, and why didn't this show up on demo one? And then also for Kathy, are you expecting to process any waivers for the uh, Dragon Crew one flight? Yeah, so um, the... Uh um, I, I'm not sure I can, I can say it's an estimate because it's really just locally and in one particular spot. Um, it's a good, good, good reminder um, regarding demo one. We didn't see this on demo one, um, at least not to this, ex this extent um, that we noticed something. Um, it's a good question. Demo one was slightly lighter, um, had a slightly different trajectory. Maybe that, um, that caused this. Um, at the end of the day, it's great um, that we found it on this flight and, you know, um, can, can basically take corrective action going forward. Um, and also, like I said, this was not, not an unsafe situation at all. This is just something that we observed and, uh, and then basically uh, changed to make sure that nothing, nothing bad will ever happen. So um, that, that, that's the, I, like I said, on demo, demo one, um, if you look at it with hindsight, you might see uh, some erosion, but, but honestly, it's, uh, it's not, not very visible there. And Irene, um, I do not know the final count for the um, waivers, so I would ask, I would maybe hold that question and ask that question of Steve Stitch. Next, we have Rachel Joy from Florida Today. Hey there, this question is for Brian Stein. Um, back during demo two, uh, due to COVID-19, you asked that launch spectators and visitors not visit the Space Coast to watch the launch. Here we are five months later. What is NASA's approach or messaging for launch spectators for this historic launch? Thank you. Yeah, so we have to remember that even though we suggested uh, for Demo 2 people not come to the launch, uh, it certainly didn't prevent them from coming. And, and there were massive crowds, you know, outside of the Kennedy Space Center. Um, so what we're asking people to do is, is follow CDC guidelines, to follow the guidelines from the state of Florida, um, and keep, keep do, do what is necessary to keep safe. I mean, that's, that's ultimately what our objective is. I will tell you that we are limiting um, the amount of visitors that can come onto the Kennedy Space Center. We have a lot of, as you're aware, we have a lot of very important missions coming up. My number one objective is to make sure that we don't have an outbreak at the Kennedy Space Center. We've been very successful keeping our people safe so far. We want to make sure that we, we keep them safe so that ultimately we can continue to do the, the mission um, of, of NASA and the United States of America. We'll now go over to Megan Bartles from Space.com. Hi, thanks so much for taking my question. This is Megan Bartels with Space.com with a question for, I think, Hans. You mentioned recently that the new heat shield, the new heat shield design was tested last week. Could you talk a little bit more about what that process was and how closely it mimics what the capsule will undergo when the, the crew of one astronauts re-enter? Thanks. Yes, of course. So um, 
The test we do is a um, it's called an ArcJet test, and uh, it is in a NASA facility in um, Moffett. I don't remember the center right now. It's uh, it's up here in California. I'm really embarrassed by, uh, by by not knowing the name right now. But I actually wasn't there. I did I did look at the uh, the wind tunnel, that ArcJet tunnel, uh, a while back, and it's it's pretty impressive because it can can very well recreate the uh, the situation. But then the 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 uh, size of the uh, area you can test is uh, is obviously not very very large. It's a relatively small area. So I think we um, in terms of of, of as realistic testing as you can, we did what we could, um, and uh, and then we also do uh, you know a lot of analysis and uh, make sure that we got any any flow phenomenon uh, worked out from the analysis side based on the flight data we saw with uh, demo two and uh, and then you know last but not least um, there I also mentioned that uh, CRS twenty one the, uh, the the new cargo dragon will go up a month after. Um, after uh, crew one, and this particular dragon will come back earlier, so that gives us another chance to validate the design and to make sure that everything is uh, is safe and uh, and good going forward. And it, and it's Ames. It was done at the uh, Ames Research Center, um, and uh, obviously NASA and um, SpaceX folks have been looking at it. We have a lot of um, thermal protection system experts too, and everybody understands kind of how to correlate the data from those samples and be able to understand it, and I think we're very satisfied with the design. We have time for one or two more questions. We'll next go to Morgan McFall Johnson from Business Insider. Hi, thanks so much for taking my question. This one is for Kathy or Jim, maybe. Um, you've got a whole bunch of data back from demo to now. Uh, I'm just wondering if you found any pleasant surprises in looking over that. And relatedly, do you have a new average estimated LOC and LOM numbers for crew one? And if so, what drove that change? Thanks so much. Kathy, I'll let you answer this. Okay. Um, so the lock requirements that we had were design requirements, and so those are closed out. They'll be closed out during our, cer our certification phase. It's a, it's a design requirement over kind of the life of the program. Um, and so uh, all of uh, SpaceX met, I think the final number was 1 in 276, and so um, met the NASA requirements for it. Um, I actually, demo two went so well for us. Um, you know, we're spending a lot of time talking about those two pieces, um, but honestly, the spacecraft launch went beautifully, rendezvous, docking went beautifully. Um, like I talked about, we were able to do the four crew test, the habitability test while the vehicle was on orbit. Um, you know, the uh, return, you know, went beautifully first time coming back. Um, and Bob and Doug were able to give us great insight on how the vehicle operated through all the phases of flight. So I don't think I'm, you know, it would be a great mission if Crew One goes exactly the same way. So I'm counting on it, Hans. <laughs> I'm counting on a beautiful mission the exact same way. So um, I'm, we're looking forward to this. This is going to be a great day. Thanks to all who submitted questions today, and thanks to today's briefers for taking the time to discuss this historic event. This is the first in our series of briefings today. Next up is a briefing to discuss the Crew-1 mission overview. That's at 12.30 p.m. Eastern, and we'll host the astronauts of Crew-1 for a news conference at 2 p.m. For details on these briefings and for the latest on this mission, please visit nasa.gov slash commercial crew. Thanks again for joining us. That will wrap up today's briefing. Thank you.